Well, the Oxford High School massacre in November 2021 is really what prompted state lawmakers to make an extra push for gun reform. Uh, and now we have several new laws going into effect coincidentally and consequentially exactly one year since the mass shooting on the campus of Michigan State University. So we're here with Pat Miles today, former U.S. attorney for the Western District of Michigan. I appreciate you coming here to talk about this very important and, and sensitive topic today. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So there are really uh, there are several new gun laws that fall under four main ideas or objectives that would be um, universal background checks, safe storage, extreme risk protection orders, and limits on domestic abusers. I want to start with background checks first because that's not necessarily something brand new to the state of Michigan because background checks have already been in place for handguns. So what is new about this version of that law? What's new is the long gun provision, mm -hmm. which is anything over 24 inches, a rifle, shotgun, et cetera. And that, that is going to also require a background check, which you can have both state, where you and the state police uh, really handle most of this, where they would look into the criminal uh, background system here in Michigan, the lean system, the law enforcement uh, information network, and then also federal firearms uh, licensees who are dealers, they have to check the federal NICS system, the National uh, Instant Criminal Check System. And that's looking at people who are ineligible to have a gun, people who have a felony conviction. Maybe in their history they've got an involuntary uh, institutionalization due to in incapacity, uh, mental health reason. And so that's what they're, they're looking for now. So th those are all things. I just want to hear exactly what even shows up on a background check, because I think that's something uh, that is maybe a misconception that, oh, maybe it's a, a felony and that's about it. They don't really check into your mental health history. But um, what exactly are they looking for in a background check? They're, they're just looking for ineligibility to have a weapon, a firearm. Mm -hmm. And so it would be a felony. It would also be, again, involuntary institutionalization, uh, whether it's by a court order or some other uh, legal means that someone's been in an institution for mm -hmm. a mental, particularly for a mental health reason. Uh, those rights can be restored uh, through a, a process uh, afterwards. Uh, they can try to get their gun rights restored as well. Mm -hmm. That, the background checks along with safe storage were both signed by the governor on the same day, April 13th of last year. Uh, they're usually referred to as common sense gun laws. Is that how you view them as well? I think the public is, is, is wildly in favor of these fairly, uh, yes, common sense, minimal restrictions on gun ownership. In fact, they, they're really not even a restriction as, as much as they are just a, a, a step in a process towards getting a firearm. Mm -hmm. And so it really is involving taking uh, a little bit of time to conduct these background checks or if somebody uh, has had uh, domestic violence issue going on, that, that they, they can be restricted from getting a firearm. Uh, because of the potential for violence, as well as the safe storage. I mean, we've, the public has seen so many instances of children accessing loaded weapons, bringing them to a school, maybe even shooting up a school, and limiting that access to the people who are the responsible gun owner it, by having a lock having uh, a way that the, the weapon can only be used by that person who it's intended to be used by, that does make a lot of sense. And so uh, gun rights are, the Second Amendment is not an absolute, pro you, can, you can't carry a firearm onto a, an airplane, for example, you, you have to be a certain age. And so these are just procedural steps uh, to prevent people who don't, need to have a firearm, especially at that moment. And so uh, it, we're seeing way too many. When, when guns, uh, gun violence is the leading cause of death among children, uh, then we've got a problem. And so this legislation uh, is an effort to fix that problem. And relating to safe storage, I mean, we saw that in the case of the Oxford High School shooting. A 15-year-old, Ethan Crumbly, uh, grabs a gun that was 
purchased for him by his father. Uh, so that's one issue to address separately, but uh, it wasn't stored safely, brings it to school and, uh, you know, kills few, a few of his classmates. So had this rule been in place, how far would it have gone to prevent some of these shootings from happening? Or is it just making it easier to address things on the back end through prosecution and through the trial process? Both. I think okay. both this law is, once public, there raises public awareness, I think it will give people who have a, a firearm, that possess a firearm legally, to stop and think, okay, I have a child in my house, or I'm going to a home where there's children and the gun is in my car, I better lock it in a safe, not just put it in the glove compartment. And so it's, it's a stop and think type of policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that is a preventative measure, of course. And the way this law works is it's not really like where an office, as my understanding, is an officer just can walk by and say, oh, that's an unload, you know, it's an unlocked box. It actually has to come into possession of a child. Mm -hmm. So actually there actually is another step to be criminally liable here. But it also, uh, it, it could have prevented some of these, these unfortunate incidents. Mm -hmm. uh, where if those parents had been more thoughtful about, well, I can get in trouble if my child gets access to this gun, I better lock it and make sure he or she is not able to access it. Mm -hmm. And likewise, I think that there's a lot of uh, good policy here on the back end for, for prosecutors to say, look, it stands, the child had access to the gun, the child even discharged the weapon or brought the weapon to school, that's a pretty easy case for a prosecutor to win, uh, to enforce. So it's both. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's both to be preventative as well as to help uh, the prosecution of these types of, of violations. One of the arguments we hear a lot is that laws like these infringe on the rights of responsible gun owners, but shouldn't responsible gun owners already be doing things like safe storage? It, it, exactly. I think when you say responsible, what is responsible? And, and this is just putting into law what would be responsible gun ownership. Keeping an unloaded weapon or being uh, safe, making sure a loaded weapon is locked away and safe, making sure children and whoever shouldn't have access to that weapon, preventing them from having access to it. That's responsible gun ownership. This is just codifying that type of an ownership issue. Uh, so I think that that, as well as perhaps the uh, red flag where someone if, is, has been uh, accused uh, or, or found uh, to be a domestic uh, violator, you know, they, they should not at that moment especially be having a firearm mm -hmm. uh, because at that moment they may not be a responsible gun owner. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about next, too, because Michigan is the 21st state now to implement extreme risk protection orders, also known as red flag laws. Uh, that red flag designation, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's the term we give to it because it, it, it's a reminder of why it's in place in the first place, because it, it's to keep firearms out of the hands of people who might raise a red flag, might be mm -hmm. uh, at risk of harming themselves or others. But it's not... It's not so cut and dry. This one's more of a, of a subjective law rather than objective because information would have to be presented to a judge. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly would a judge have to be looking for in order to issue a court order for someone to not own a firearm? Well, and that's a key point is that there is a procedural uh, guardrail here at, where you have to with a judge making a determination and the judge is certainly going to look at the totality of the situation the facts and the individual's history uh, if there if there is a history of violence a history of personal protection orders being taken out that, that go back several months or years then that is certainly going to be taken in, into account versus somebody who's never had a history of, of violence. Uh, the credibility of the, of the person who's bringing the claim against this person, uh, that's also going to be weighed by the judge as well. And it's not just law enforcement who can present uh, a petition to the judge either. That's exactly right. It could be friends or family. Uh, can 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 make that petition as well on behalf of somebody else who and again i mean there's there's a whole 
uh, library of, of psychology going into mm -hmm. domestic violence and the results of that and the way the dynamics play out. So sometimes uh, abusers and, and somebody who's been abused really may not be the person who wants to bring that type of an action. And so it might be law enforcement, it might be friends, family, who would have to do it. But then again, there are protections, procedural, legal protections, before the ultimate step mm -hmm. of, of restricting someone's ability to have a firearm. Because this one specifically is a little more subjective, more than half the counties in Michigan have declared themselves Second Amendment sanctuaries. Uh, and the county sheriffs uh, in a lot of these areas have made it very clear publicly that even once they go into effect, they don't plan on enforcing these laws. Dana Nessel has made it clear that even if you won't, I'll find someone that, that will. Is there any, can, can these counties decide that they don't want to enforce laws that are, that are laws come February 13th? I, you know, really, the, no. The answer is no. Uh, the counties uh, are creatures or corporate underneath the state mm -hmm. authority, and they're under state law. And so th they really do need, those uh, law enforcement officials need to follow the state law. And so uh, that's, of course, a tension uh, between elected officials. It's unfortunate that that would occur from a political standpoint, but really, uh, in, in a lot of the law enforcement officials uh, that I know uh, on the streets, they want some of these protections in place. It makes their job uh, a little safer, a little better. Uh, so a great many of them are very much in favor of these, these types of laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that if there are elected officials who choose not to follow the law, then the voters will have to decide ultimately whether they retain an office uh, by virtue of them not fulfilling their oath of office. Mm -hmm. You worked obviously more on the, the national, the federal level. Uh, so I'm curious, are there any gaps in the gun laws that are in place nationally that some of these state laws aim to address? In terms of, well, there's, there are federal laws and of course with the states have their own laws and so these state laws actually are really addressing some of the gaps in fact some of the times in some states uh, their law enforcement when they do a background check they're not required to check the federal uh, and NICS system the National Instant Criminal Check System they just rely on their own state background check and they're not checking the federal database and so there are gaps like that uh, there unfortunately there's still some even gaps in the federal system uh, that are being resisted uh, in terms of when somebody tries to buy a weapon for somebody somebody who for somebody who's ineligible now there are laws to enforce that but uh, it's not caught uh, mm -hmm. instantly like it could and should be and so that's getting guns in the hands of of usually gang members or drug dealers, very violent people, and uh, they're using straw purchasers, girlfriends, friends, family members who have clean records, unlike them, mm -hmm. and then they are purchasing several weapons on behalf of these other people. It's illegal, yes, but it's not being caught oftentimes on the front end when it, when it should and could be before these weapons can be used to hurt uh, innocent people or law enforcement officers. We've talked a lot about the legal implications, the context, but I'm just curious on a personal level, how far do you think all these new laws will go toward protecting people in the state of Michigan? Well, they, they, I think they're going to go farther than we are now, obviously, and it's going to be an improvement. And so, again, these are very reasonable measures. Uh, they, they're... they're narrowly tailored, if you will, to address very specific problems, problems that we have experienced, problems that we've seen repeatedly over the last few decades. And so uh, they, time will tell that we will start, I think, we will start to see some lowering and reduction in the number of people, or especially children, who are harmed by gun violence. Will it be eliminated entirely? No. But I think we will start seeing some reductions because th these are very reasonable. This is good legislation. It's a good start. Is there anything else you would like to see implemented? <laughs> uh, 
Not at this. I mean, I'm, I'm just not going to comment. Yeah, on that. that's okay. <laughs> that's a good. That's I'm a good. If comment. I could squeeze it out of you, <laughs> if I was the, uh, you know, in a different position, a different maybe. position, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Is there anything else you want to add then on that note? Uh, I think just the public is speaking out, uh, desiring these types of uh, changes and improvements. Uh, the polling is showing that, and so uh, really. A, a, a fairly vocal minority opposing these uh, types of, of laws. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's our system. But again, these laws seem to be very reasonable. They seem to be as minimal list as, as possible to address very specific, very real problems that are occurring in our American society today in our state, unfortunately, that we've seen in the past couple of years. So uh, this this is a welcome uh, improvement. I think it's going to be welcome not just by the public, but also by law enforcement who's out there working day to day in the streets. The start of a new era come February 13th, 2024. Pat Miles, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Appreciate it.